I enjoy starting each new year when I teach the beginning of each new year, and I've done it forever. Uh, I like to cover the subject of love. I think it's a good subject to be reminded of, and I certainly think of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when I think of this subject, uh, in particular when he had just got done healing the man who had the legion of spirits, and he was done with that, he moves on, and as he moves on, this man comes running up to him uh, with uh, great haste, he throws himself down at the Lord's feet, and, and with, I can't imagine the intensity, he asks the Lord to come with him to his house, because his daughter is nigh unto death. His daughter is 12 years old, uh, his, his, his only daughter, she's 12 years old, and she's close to dying. Jesus agreed to go with him. Have you ever been doing something that you're intensely involved in, and the phone rings, and all of a sudden, AT&T calls or somebody to, has no purpose at all and interrupts you, or they do have a purpose? I mean, Jesus is going along, and now all of a sudden, there is this interruption into his life. Wherever he was going or whatever he was doing just got interrupted, and in a very intense situation. Can you come to my house and heal my daughter? Jesus agrees, and they start moving towards the man's house. And, uh, and there's a, you know, the apostles are with him. There's a big crowd of people that are around him. You know, I expect at this point in Jesus' life, wherever he went, there was a crowd of people. And uh, there was that woman with the issue of blood, 12 years of bleeding, uh, ironically the same age as the you know, same amount of time as this 12-year-old girl that was near to dying. Anyhow, she comes in, and her thought is, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. So she works her way through the crowd. She gets up to Jesus. She grabs hold of the hem of his garment, and sure enough, what happens? She's made healed. She's healed. She's made whole. And uh, Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples say to him, Lord, who touched you? I mean, who didn't touch you? I mean, look at the crowd here. They didn't say it that way, but they said, you know, this is a multitude here. He said, no, no, no. Power went out from me. And he turned around, and I imagine how this is the way it works. He turned around. And he looked in the crowd, and I'm sure it wasn't hard to figure out who touched him, because she had to be, you know, with a smile from one ear to the other. She just got healed after 12 years of bleeding. And then the woman came up to him, and she confessed what was going on, that she had worked her way through in her faith. And then Jesus says to a woman, your faith has made you whole. And now we're going to go back to this man's house, because the daughter is nigh unto death. And I can imagine if you're the father of that child, watching all of this happen really must have bolstered his faith. I mean, it was like, wow, this is great. I got the Messiah, I got, you know, the prophet, whoever he thought he was, and this just healed us. This is good news. But as soon as that was done, someone came from his house and ran up to him and said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further, the master any further. And then Jesus, I mean, just you go, from, you go from the mountain right down to the valley real quick. But Jesus turned around and he said to that man, do not be afraid, only what? Believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. And then they continue on. So Jesus you know, addressed that which would have caused the man to to greatly stumble, and they go, they go to this house, they get to the house, and when they go in, apparently some time had gone by, but when they go in, there's a crowd of people in there, and they're, they're crying, they're, they're mourning. You know, it's, it reminds me of like the first 30 minutes of when a funeral, is, or you're at the cemetery, not the, uh, the funeral home, and the family gathers for the first time to see their, the deceased person they love. It's a very, very intense time. Everybody's crying, and weeping and all the rest, because it's not only a death, it's a death of a child. And um, Jesus walks into that. He's got Peter, John, and James with him. He walks into that with the Father, and he says the most bizarre thing. He said, why are you all crying? Why are you weeping? She's not dead. She's sleeping. And, and you know the record. They all burst out into laughter. Of course, when you, when you read that, it's kind of an odd thing. 
except if you've been to a situation or in a situation where there is such really intense emotion involved, somebody says something a little bit off color, and your emotions are bubbling over and you start laughing. I could see how this would happen. Everybody started laughing at him. Again, Jesus fights through that. He fights through that and says to the, to the father and the mother, come with me into the room. Peter, John, and James went in. He goes over where the little girl is. He grabs her by the hand and he says to her, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And you know what happens, right? She got up from the dead. And of all that I've just told you that Jesus went through, he, you know, it took his time, it took his resources, it took his energy, it took him having to fight for that guy when that, the, the word came that she had died, having been humiliated by the people that were there. But the most outstanding part of this record and incident, I haven't really told you yet, as it relates to love. And that is, he said, surely she is hungry, Get her something to eat. I mean, that just, ugh, that's our Lord. Concerned about the details. Concerned about every aspect of a person's life. She surely, well, she was sick for a long time, sick enough that she died, and Jesus' concern was get her something to eat. you got to love our Lord. You really do. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. It says in uh, verse 1, these two great verses, Ephesians 5, 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, a fragrant aroma. These, these two verses are telling us to love, to be imitators of God, and to love like Jesus loved. And on the screen here, I put this very familiar verse to us from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 44, where it says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Therefore, that latter part there, verse 48, there it's, therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And what we read in Ephesians was is to be imitators of God. Well, what do we see here about God? God telling us to love our enemies, to pray for those who, who despitefully use us, and to be like He does. He makes the sun to shine on the good and the bad, and the rain likewise. What is that saying? It's saying love without partiality. Love not because of circumstances, not because of the people or situations, rather love because, like God, it's intrinsic to who we are as people. God is love. God loves other people. God loves all people, not because of people's behavior or because people deserve it. He loves people because He is love. It comes from within who He is. It's His characteristics, His trait. And He's saying, what this is saying to us, be like God. Love not because of any other reason than that God loves you and you love him and therefore you are loving. You're loving all the time. You're loving to the people who are near you, to your family, to your friends, to your co-workers, even to your enemies. And that is not because of any of those people, but because of that's who you are. You're a lover. And we're supposed to love like that. And then the other thing in Ephesians said to walk in love just as Christ also walked in love. And I always think of uh, his time with his disciples right before he's taken into you know, being uh, arrested, being incarcerated. After that great Last Supper, when he did so many things, instituted communion, talked to him about the new covenant, talked to him about the Holy Spirit, talked to him about, you know, illustrated for them how you're supposed to love in washing their feet. He said to them, I want you to, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love like me. 
And at this point, you know, this is at the end of his life. So he, they had seen his whole life. You know, the, the apostles, these are the people that are with him. They've seen him in every different kind of situation. Some of them very negative, some of them very positive. And he said, I want you to love like I love. And what I take from this is that with Jesus, his love and his compassion was always con connected with God's wisdom. I think that love and compassion without wisdom can be very dangerous and very counterproductive. I think that many people do things because they love the other individual, their compassion, like parents, for example. A parent loving their child, they give their child whatever their child wants. They want this truck, they want that, they want this, they, and you give them everything that they want. And you do that because you love them. Or, or, you know, if the kid has a, a tantrum, he's, okay, that's okay, honey, you're okay. Instead of disciplining the child, and you, you do all that you're doing because you love the child, but there's no wisdom there. That child is going to grow up to be a very uh, maladjusted individual as an adult. Children need discipline. They need to know that they can't have everything that they want because... It's just not the way life is, you know, when they, when they go to work and they say to the boss, well, I want a raise, what do you mean, you don't give me a raise, I'm going <laughs> to, you know, it, it doesn't work like that in life, right? So what, my, what I'm trying to say is, is that in that situation, the parents are doing what they're doing because of love and compassion, but it lacks wisdom. You have to have wisdom with love. The other scenario that I thought of in this regard is that so often when there's a functioning, somewhat seemingly functioning alcoholic or drug addict, there's usually an enabler somewhere, giving them a place to live, helping them, providing for them, helping them to continue on in their wrong lifestyle. And they do that because they love the person. And really, what they, if they had wisdom and understanding, they would do just the opposite of what they're doing. My point is, especially watching the life of Jesus, because it's every kind of scenario. You see him with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and these people who were out there, his enemies, how he dealt with them, and then how he dealt with this, this uh, father and how he dealt with the woman with the issue of blood and this little girl. Not, none of it's the same. The, what's the same is the love, but the wisdom that goes with each situation merits its own revelation from God. So if we're going to love, if we're going to be an imitator of God and love like he loved, and we're going to walk like Jesus did in love, we need the wisdom of God. In order to have the wisdom of God, you know what we need. We need the Spirit of God. If you don't have the Spirit of God, none of that's going to work. Our problem is we're born with a human nature, and it's just all upside down, our human nature. See that, how I got that upside down? Isn't that smart? That human nature, and uh, that human nature is such that um, human nature is very self-focused and uh, very selfish and self-centered. I had the slide I wanted to show you that. Wait a minute. Look at this, this slide here where it's self is at the center of life. We're born with self at the center of our life. And because of that... We're egocentric. You know, it's, we're very self-centered. It's all about us. The world is evolving around us. And uh, that's our human nature. This is common to every person who was born with the exception of Jesus Christ. And because of that, selfishness is something that is a part of us. Very self-serving. And, and arrogant or, uh, you know, prideful about who we are and uh, what we deserve in life. It reminds me very much of what we see with children. Here's these two little girls, and you can't really see it clearly, but in the background there's a ton of other toys, right? And what are they doing? They're fighting over that one toy. I know that this has never happened to any of your children, but uh, why? Because they're self-centered and selfish. I like these two girls. I think the one on the left, or which I guess would be the one on your, yeah, on your left too, I think she's smiling and happy and then because she's annoying the girl on the, in the blue, right? She's trying to steal her teddy bear away. Human nature. And then I love this one. Look at the look on that boy's face. He is just, you're not getting my bear no matter what. This is my bear. I'm not giving you my bear. Ah, I want that bear. 
And, and why do children behave this way? Because they're humans. And as humans, we have self at the center. This is our human nature. And, and, to, and so in order for us to love like God loves, in order for us to love like Christ loved, we needed to have an overhaul. We needed to have our human nature to receive the Spirit of God. With the Spirit of God, there is a transformation that takes place in a human's life. There's a major transformation. With the Spirit of God, that Spirit of God pours the love of God into us. You know, it says that in Romans, right? That the, that the love of God is poured out into us with the Spirit of God. That it says, in, it says in Corinthians 5 that all things are changed. All things become new. We are different people. We are people that are God-like and Christ-like so that we can live as we're instructed to do in Ephesians chapter 5. So if God's at the center, it's god is our focus and not self. You know, there, there are a lot of people that do a lot of good things for other people. There's a lot of, uh, boy, oh boy, this, during the holiday season, um, they, they, they over-advertise about, you know, helping this group and helping that group and giving to this group and sending money here and supporting here, all of, you know, appealing to the, the loving charity of people. And I, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that we live in a nation that has that kind of mindset. It's wonderful. Uh, however, I, I am also, Mimi and I went to a conference many years ago uh, when and there was like 150 people there. So it was a big conference and most of the people that were there were counselors and pastors and, you know, people that were in uh, that kind of business, right? The church, people involved in the church. And this guy gets up and he starts... He, he was, he was tremendous. He, he had a great presentation. And he said, you know, you know why many people, he didn't say most, he said, you know why many people become pastors and why many people become doctors and nurses and counselors? He said, because they want to help other people because there's something missing inside of them. And when they help other people, they feel better about themselves. And... Uh, he said that, that, you know, that human nature thing, see, self is still at the center, and it's about gratifying oneself rather than doing what we do because God is at the center and doing it because of God loves us and we love God, and because of that, I can love humanity. And my love for humanity is not based upon how humanity responds. I don't need you to validate me. I don't need you to give me that a boy so I can feel good about life. You call that, when you have that backwards, it's called being um, an enabler. It's also called being codependent, right? A codependent person is dependent upon other people smiling at them, and when they don't smile at them and they frown at them, all of a sudden their life falls apart. This is why so many parents, when their children grow up and leave home, they're shattered because they're so dependent on their child and their whole life is to, well, that's, that's, a, that's a kind of a gross generalization there. I take that back. Uh, they're sad to see their children go. Some of us have parties and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's another story. But I think you get my point, right? Is that when, the, way, the right way to love is to have God at the center of our life. And when God is at the center of our life, then our love for other people can truly be based upon our relationship with God and not our relationship with them. And whether the person responds in a positive way or a negative way, it makes no difference because we're not doing it for a response. We're doing it for God. So it's really, really imperative if we're going to love like God loves and like Christ loved to have God-centered life, that God-focused. Then there's that selflessness, and uh, then it's truly loving service in which we glorify God. Please turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse 24.
Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever wishes to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in glory of his Father with his angels, and then will repay every man according to his deeds. It's at that time that we're rewarded for the loving actions that we have today in our lives. It's not today that we get rewarded for it. And I, I really, I've always uh, favored this verse of Scripture because basically how I interpret it, what it's saying to me is, die to self. It's not about me. The world's not around, revolving around me. It's not, I'm not in doing the things of God because of you or anybody else. It's because of God. And in order for that to happen, that old human nature has to die. And that's the battle of our life as Christians, right? Is having to fight the human self-centered nature as opposed to um, having God at the center and the God-centered nature. Uh, I, I also think of that time where the lawyer came up to Jesus and, and, uh, <laughs> and said to him, uh, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question. Everybody should want to know the answer to that. And Jesus said to him, well, you know the commandments. What do you think the commandments say? And the, and the lawyer responded, well, love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, that's well said. You're right. And uh, you're, you're close to having that eternal life. But then the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells him this story, which we're all pretty well familiar with, about this man who uh, got mugged on the side of the road. And, uh, you know, they, they took his clothing and his belongings and they beat him and wounded him. And he's laying there, passed out on the street. And uh, a priest goes by and sees the man laying there. And he walks on the other side of the road and doesn't help him. And then a Levite who is also a religious person that is supposed to be, anyhow, supposed to be involved in the service of the temple and so on. He sees the man and he walks around the man and doesn't help him. But then this Samaritan, the most like, unlikely individual to get involved with helping someone who's from the Israel background, a Samaritan who is hated by the Israelites, he gets involved, he goes over to the man who is wounded and naked, and he binds up his wounds, he helps him, he puts him on his beast, his animal, and he takes him to the inn, and he gives the innkeeper two denario. A denario is believed to be a day's wages. He gives him this money, he says, take care of this man, and if, it, if there's any more expenses when I come back, I will pay it for you. And then Jesus says to the, to, the, uh, to the lawyer, which one of these do you think was a neighbor unto the man? He said, the Samaritan. And Jesus said, why don't you go and do the same? And don't ask me questions anymore. <laughs> That's what I would have said. But um, again, I love the record because you see that love and compassion requires time. It's an inconvenient in, into you. The most precious thing we got is time, and it's an investment of time, a lot of energy, and sometimes resources. Like in this situation, the example that Jesus, Jesus gave the example, basically, of what it means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He really didn't answer the man's question. The question was, who's your neighbor? He didn't really answer that. He said, this is the way you love. You get involved, you care, you, get, you do something. And then I, you, you got to love the detail. Not only did he bind the guy up and take him to a place where he could get help, he left money in case for the guy and then said, if there's anything else, let me know and I'll take care of it. Love carries it all the way through to the end. I love that. It carries it all the way through to the end. What a, what a tremendous example. I had a friend um, 
that died a couple of years ago, and, and uh, at his uh, memorial service that somebody else was conducting, uh, Ast Astrobin is, is the man's name. Uh, I, I, uh, I know Astrobin because I met him at the uh, Salvation Army, and his story, which he wouldn't be very happy for me to tell you, he told his story often to other people. He, he, he found himself in the, uh, the bus station down, down in Albany, and uh, here he was, and he was sleeping on the benches. He had, he had burned all of the bridges. He came, he came from a, a, a very good family, a very educated family, as most of his siblings were successful professional people. But he had, because of his addiction and his, his uh, drug use, he had burned bridges with all of his siblings, with his parents, and nobody wanted to help him anymore. He had no place to go. He had no, what he was wearing was all that he owned. He had no longer any belongings, and he, he didn't know what to do. It just so happened back then, the bus station was, uh, not too far from the bus station was the city mission. It was uh, closer than it is currently. And, and uh, somehow, he ended up going to the city mission, and eventually he ended up going to the Salvation Army. And at the Salvation Army, there was a nine-month program and during that period of time, my friend met some other Christian believers that live in the Albany area, really good, good people. And, and uh, they really helped him to accept Christ into his life. And uh, the going through the rehab just totally transformed this man from being uh, a user and an abuser. And, you know, at the end of his rope to being someone that was just full of life and gratitude. And Strobin, uh, the story that somebody told was... When they were with the Strobin, they were going in, in downtown Albany, and they were going around. I forget what they were doing. And Strobin saw some guy on the side of the road who was uh, sitting there with one of those cardboard signs, you know, asking for money. And uh, Strobin related to this guy because he himself had done the same thing numerous times in his life. So he reached into his pocket, and he went over to the man, and everything that he had in his pocket he gave to the man. All the money he had. And as he's walking away, you know, he just, he, he feels that God is saying, Astrobin, that is not enough. Go back. So Astrobin goes back to where the man is. Like I said, the man was sitting on the ground. Astrobin goes back and he sits down next to him. And he says, he says to this man, you know, God does love you. And, and he witnesses to him. And then he does the most loving thing, he takes the man into his arms and he holds him. The man starts crying. He said, I haven't been touched by anybody in years. He smelled. He was filthy. That, to me, is a great example of going the extra mile. The money enough, what the man needed was love. And that's what Estrovan gave him that day. That, I think, is the love of God. Look at, look at um, Romans, chapter thir Romans chapter 12. There's so many records in the scripture. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you some of my old favorites, but there's so many places in the scriptures that talk about love. I was... Very blessed that Wendy decided to read this this morning because uh, as we took the offering. In Romans chapter 12, verse 8, it says, He who exhorts in his exhortation, Romans 12, 8, he who gives with liberty, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy. A poor what is evil, cling to what is good. The only way our love can be without hypocrisy if our love is devoid of self. If it isn't self-centered, if our love is God-centered, then we're loving like God. If, we, if our love is like Christ's, then you know, it's not about us, it's about God, and it's about the person we're trying to love. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be devoted to one another with brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor, to give preference to one another 
in honor. And, and I, I go to this verse because I think honoring other people is something that is something that could it's so easy to do, and yet it's so often neglected to, to be done. Uh, I, and you know, it's, again, it's in the kind of the details. It's, you know, give her something to eat, she's hungry. You know, here's an extra, here's the extra money. If you anything else, I'll pay it. It's going the extra yard. It's doing the little things that are more honoring, you know, and what my friend de Strobin did, you know, in hugging the man. And uh, and the the little like honoring somebody, um, opening the door for them, instead of you know, opening the door for yourself and then ignoring the people behind you, but rather stepping to the side and letting the other people go in. That's very honoring of somebody. It's a very easy thing to do. And uh, these are the kinds of things that God would love for us to do. I, I was at the doctor's office uh, last week, which, you know, is always a fun thing to do. I love doing that. And um, that was sarcasm. John understood it because he's from Long Island. Anyhow, so um, I'm online there, and it's, you know, I'm on, I'm on a line, and, uh, and uh, there's a couple of people in front of me, and then this woman, and there's one guy behind me, and this woman comes in with a cane, and she's kind of limping in, and the guy behind me said, well, why don't you go ahead of me, ma'am, and uh, you don't have to wait, you know, longer, and I thought, wow, that was really loving, so I said to her, too, yeah, you can go ahead of me, too, and she said, no, nah, you, nah, I don't want to, I'll stay in the back, but the point is, is that letting somebody ahead of you in line that's a, that's a very honoring thing. You know, it's a very kind thing to do. It's a part of how we can love. Um, <laughs> listening to someone when they're talking to you is good, you know. And uh, doing this while somebody is talking to you, which is so common today, right? Put your dang phone down and look at the person and listen to the person. You know, uh, that's a, it's a very honoring thing to do. It's a very loving thing to do. And, and, and here's, along with that, paying attention to what they're saying is, is also a good thing to do. And, uh, you know, that you, you're, you're engaged in what is being communicated to you. That also is a very honoring thing to do. When you're eating with other people, uh, you, th you think that something motivated me with these, when I, to say these things? <laughs> when you're eating with other people, the idea behind it, what, what the Lord shares with us and what we read in the scripture, this is supposed to be a time of fellowship. It isn't supposed to be a time to see how fast you can get the food in your mouth and dropped on the table. It's enjoy the fellowship with each other. I mean, the, the, the Lord, the, we're encouraged to fellowship with each other and to eat with each other, to break bread with one another. That's in the book of Acts, that's what they talk about, breaking bread. But it, it wasn't, you know, shoveling, it wasn't about you satisfying your hunger, it was about you interacting with other people. This is all a part of being loving. Um, being thoughtful regarding other persons and in the sense of being the initiator of how can I, not just being a responder to someone else being there, but how can I initiate love to another person? Like, like Sean shared last week uh, with prayer. You know, the person will never even know you're praying for them, uh, but you, you, know, you, can, you can bless that, that's love. You can pray for that other person and bless them. Or, or uh, you know, it's one thing to be loving to someone that's in your presence. It's another thing to be loving and thoughtful and kind to someone that isn't in your presence and maybe giving them a call or praying for them or sending them a loving card or giving them a little gift or, you know, having that being more aggressive with our love rather than being reactionary with our love, but being the aggressor with our love. That's what I'm trying to say. I think that these are all a part of, of, of love. And I think acknowledging people, uh, uh, just acknowledging people. When you're, when you're with other people, just acknowledge. I, I, I think of uh, children, uh, little children, you know, small kids. What I have often done in my life, I don't do it so much 
as I used to, uh, but where I get, I get down and look them in the eyes and say something to them. I never ignore a child. You know, I think that's commonly done. I'm, when I see I, your grandchildren this morning, I always greet children. They're often overlooked, little kids, and I, I don't do that. I, I don't think we should. I mean, I think, I think we should, I, I kind of I maybe don't always acknowledge adults. <laughs> I should get better on that. But, you know, that we acknowledge people. And we hear we are at our church and our fellowship when new people come in, you know, they, they're, there's a feeling of uncomfortability. You're in a strange place. You know, going up and acknowledging the person. And if, if you can at all do it, memorizing the person's name, right? And the person says to him, my name is Brian. Now, if this is the first time I've met Brian, how do I remember his name? I'm really bad at this. But the way to do it is, Brian, 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 in my brain, not out loud. I mean, he would think I was weird. If he did it. You know, say it over and over and get it embedded in your head. And then the next time I see Brian, he comes and I see him the first time. I say, hey, Brian, that, that's an honoring thing for him. All of these little things kind of add up to being someone that's outside of themselves and into the people that are around them. And um, I'm sure all the parents that listen to this will uh, want to have their children also listen to this uh, because it's, it's an important aspect of life. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about love in, a, in many ways. I just wanted to go to one point in particular in chapter 4 and verse 29, Ephesians 4, 29. Um, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. We should, we should have our words be tooled so that when we, so that we edify the people rather than tearing people down. And sometimes this is more difficult, like when you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off and uh, you want to use sign language with them at that point, uh, a better thing to do would be to roll down your window and stick your head out the window and say, oh, God bless you! <laughs> with a little different tone, though. <laughs> our words can tear people down or our words can build people up. You know, when Sean was teaching last week, he said in the beginning of the teaching, I'm going to tell you 10 things. And I thought to myself, what a rookie, 10 things. Anyone knows you're only supposed to do three. And he mentioned that. He said, oh, you're only supposed to do three, but I'm going to do 10. Oh, like he's Mr. Hotshot. He's going to do. That's not right, is it? No. We're not supposed to be judgmental or critical or tearing people down. If we don't do it in our minds, it won't come out of our mouths. We don't judge other people. We don't act like we're superior to other people. We don't make fun of other people. What we want to do is say things that build people up. You know, which, by the way, thank you guys for the music this morning. That was really tremendous. It really was. And I, I thank you so much. See, that, that doesn't take much, and, and it's sincere. You know, saying things that will elevate people and, and make them feel better about life. This is all included in love. But love doesn't happen unless we're deliberate about it and that we, we make up our mind to be loving. I, you know, I, what I, let me show you this. I probably put it on the screen here. Yeah, I did. Look at, this is the uh, Romans chapter 16. And that, uh, it says, greet, uh, that's Priscilla and Aquila, and uh, verse 5, greet or greet the church, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who for, for my life risked their own necks, look how he speaks of them, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also to all the churches of the Gentiles. Verse 5, also greet the church that is in their house. And then it says, greet, 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 greet. Why would God have Paul spend a whole chapter telling him, to give greetings to all these other people. Because that's the kind of people that we're supposed to be. We're supposed to notice other people and care about other people. Then I, uh, in Romans chapter 16, it says, Greet one another 
with a holy kiss. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, it says, All the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss. In 2 Corinthians 13.12, greet one another with a holy kiss. In 1 Thessalonians 5.26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. There is that greeting. Now, in our culture, maybe, you know, that isn't as acceptable, but we hug each other. We greet each other. I remember when I was in, when I was in France for the first time many, many years ago, and in the part of France that I was, they would greet each other with a kiss on each side. And when you went to Paris, they gave you a triple whammy. Bing, bing, bing. They kissed you three times. And in many cultures in Europe, and the, the Italians do that, to uh, that's the way I was brought up in, in kissing, you know, uh, both the men and women. That's a, it's, it's a warm greeting. That kind of attitude of love that we have for one another. That we, we treat each other in such a fashion that it lifts the other person up. It makes the other person say, you know, makes the other person feel wanted, accepted, loved. Whatever we can do to express love, we should do. So, I guess uh, in summing things up, I'll go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. In verse 8. 1 Peter 3, 8 says, to sum up, all you... Be harmoniously, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing in instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Give a blessing that you might inherit a blessing, but our blessing is going to come, as we read earlier, when Christ comes back and rewards us. So be people that give a blessing. I've said a lot here this morning. I, I would like to sum it up with this. If we love others because God loves us, that's our motivation for loving other people. That's why we can love our enemies, because it's got nothing to do with the people that we're giving our love to. We love God, we love God, God loves us, therefore we love other people. Love and compassion are wonderful but they have to be connected with wisdom. And we see this in our government a lot. A lot of the decisions that are made, they're made out of compassion, but they don't have long-term wisdom that really is going to help the person in the end. So our love and compassion has to be accompanied with the wisdom that God can give. And then love is in the details. And uh, like we saw, give the girl a hamburger. Love is in the details. And then... Our love should be aggressive. We should be looking to reach out to people, not just reactionary when the people, but want to be aggressive with loving others. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you have for us and for the great example that we have with you and with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the way that you have loved us and have given us such a great example. I thank you, Father, for um, just this wonderful life that you've called us to and for giving us the Holy Spirit so that we could live a loving life. And as we go into this new year, Father, I pray that you would, that you would help us to focus on the subject of love, not just to really put our heart and our mind into being more loving and caring towards other people. I thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.